No, I don't think they're... Why would they notice... Why would that be the first thing they say? What? They just say, oh, look, you look different. Well, you know. Oh, hello, and welcome to Office Hours, the live version of the facility where good old Professor Kyle opens up his blast doors and allows you, the nerdy public, to ask and talk about and discuss any old nerdy, sciencey, pop culture question. This is indeed live. You can chat with me, and we'll be going through a number of different topics today, of course, as we're wont to do, and we'll be going from lava planets to minks to platypes to one of your comments from the last episode at the facility, finally to infodemics. But before we get to that, I want to acknowledge, of course, that this is live, and if you want to chat with me, you can chat in the YouTube chat where I have slow mode enabled because y'all because y'all got me to think Brazilian was a language last time, and we also have super chat. Now, I can't promise I'm going to get to every single person who super chats if you're simping for science today, but I'll do my very best in this short hour that we have allotted. And if you want to continue on the conversation after this, you can become a facility staff member. You can put on a, a silky cream white lab coat and you can join the facility by going to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and get on the facility staff today where you get behind the scenes stuff, you get to join our Discord, you get uh, members only once a month live streams, <laughs> yada, yada, yada. And you can see Mr. Diglett already uh, simple for science with a 20. Longtime supporter, he's even a professor at the facility. Ha! Oh. Also, we have our uh, security team in the chat, so if you're being weird or all capsy or politically Lee, you're banned, because that's how we roll. How's everyone feeling today? Uh, you know, things are different little bit our last stream was on election day uh so you know we don't have to talk about it but uh i think it's fine to say that science is happy with it and that's all we're gonna say about that uh michael holzer says bring back the beard that's not how this works i can't just and if i could though I'd try it. A, a beard is like, um, is like Play-Doh being pushed out of your follicles by your body. If you want to think about it that way. Aubrey says, hi, how are you? Eh. Luigi Man says, I love the new channel. Hey, me too. Uh, Zachary Stewart with the 20 says, hey Kyle, your friendly neighborhood submariner here. Has anyone ever scientifically investigated the idea that supernatural events, such as what people think are ghost, uh, is just some kind of echo through time? See, now there's a problem here, and let's let's not get into too many simps, because we got to get to lava planets to start out our day here. But the problem with supernatural stuff and trying to give an explanation to supernatural stuff like you're doing is what you're actually doing is positing something even less likely. Um, well, a lot of times supernatural explanations are the most complicated and least likely explanations, so um, it's never really... Uh, scientifically or rationally um, favorable to say, well, why did my mug, why, you know, why are my chairs stacked at night? You could say it's ghosts, but that's the least likely explanation. It is literally more likely that I came into your house for no reason and stacked the chairs. That is actually mathematically more likely to have happened than there to be some immaterial plane and spirits and they're vengeful and they're all from the 1850s and there's no caveman ghosts and who writes ghost rules? I don't know. So what you're doing with time echoes in that explanation with ghosts um, is your, your time echoes isn't a thing as we know it. And so you're only uh, pushing the explanation one step further back. Well, what are time echoes? I don't know. Uh, we have Ed with the 10 says, hey, Kyle, love the new intro. <laughs> yeah, right. I had to shave my first real beard. I'm 32. A few weeks ago for work. It's crazy how quickly we come to identify ourselves with something like that. Yeah. Uh, m yeah, I feel my, I feel my face is not as elongated on the Y axis. Let's go to space. Oh, look at it. You know what that right there is? That's a lava planet. For a long time, uh, I don't know how long because I don't do any research for this show, but a long t for a long time, lava planets were a theoretical idea in astronomy, just like uh, black holes were once theoretical. 
And a lava planet would be a planet that is so early on in its formation around a star, say it's still accreting matter from the gas and dust, it's so early on in its creation that it is, um, it is still, uh, it is still hot. It hasn't cooled down. The the radiative cooling out to space hasn't cooled it down to solid rock. Or, a lava planet could be something like this, um, where it is so close to its parent star or its own sun in the solar system that it heats it up, and it is never. Cooling down. Those are the words I was looking for. So scientists just discovered one of these planets, and they describe it as a hell planet. So much worse than Venus. Why? Well, let's get a little bit closer, because I know that the lights on the spaceship make some of you feel queasy. <laughs> lava planet. This is an artist's representation of a lava planet. Does it look like this? Who knows? You know why? Because the scientists who discovered this new exo-lava planet don't really know what it looks like. <laughs> Kyle, then how can they tell what it's like? Science, you dumb dumb. <laughs> so, a scientist looking at this lava... Yes, that is a basilisk shirt. The scientist looking at the lava planet use something called uh, spectroscopy, which we talked about before, and the transit method. So the transit method, if you're not familiar, is... What would be a good way to look for planets in the dark, darkiness, dark, darkity of space? Well, you could use the sunlight from that solar system's sun to identify the planet. So if, if the sun was my face, I know, I'm radiant. The sun was my face, when this planet, this lava planet, passed in front of it, because the sun is here, light rays coming out from my face, you would see a dot, you would see some shadow pass in front of the sun. This is the transit method. From these shadows, from these planetary shadows, we can infer the size of planets um, and, and you know, uh, how quickly they orbit. And, importantly for this lav lav planet, Dale Grant says beard for hire, shut up. <laughs> and uh, when light is passing past... I'm being redundant. Passing around the sorry the planet in this transit method, it's also passing through any potential atmosphere, and this is where the spectroscopy comes in. So spectroscopy is where light is moving through some material and interacting with some material, and we identify the wavelengths of light that those materials absorb. And so if we look at the incoming light, we can see what bands so to speak, of light are missing. And so if we can see what bands of light are missing in our spectrum, then we can say that that means there's probably uh, you know, methane in the atmosphere or phosphine or oxygen because they all absorb different wavelengths of light. And if they're not there, that means they're being absorbed by the planet. This planet, though, is a hellscape. If, if, if the people who wrote the Bible knew about things like this, it would be so much worse. It wouldn't just be like a three-headed demon in half encased in ice eating your butt. <laughs> Which is in Dante's Inferno. It would be much more like this. Why? Because this is pretty much the worst of all possible worlds. Uh, this planet is K2-141b, because scientists are really good at naming things. Um, and it's locked around its sun. It's in uh, about two-thirds of this, which is why it looks like this, is in perpetual daylight. So, on the day side of this exoplanet, it's over 3,000 degrees Celsius. And on the night side, perpetual darkness of this lava planet, which we should call Mustafar, obviously, it gets to below 200 degrees Celsius, which is colder than liquid nitrogen. And that could freeze a banana. <laughs> so, you know, that's cold. On this hell planet, it's so hot that not only is there a hundred kilometers of magma ocean everywhere, which would be bad enough, it would be kind of Mustafari, right? It's so hot that rocks are vaporized by this heat. 
And when, va when the rocks are vaporized by this heat, they enter into and create kind of a wispy atmosphere. And this convection, this motion of heat and energy moves the rock vapor over to the uh, night side of the planet where it gets cold enough for the rocks to become rocks again. And then it gets into the magma again. And then it goes to the day side. And so this planet is so hellish that its atmosphere is made out of vaporized rocks that mimics the water cycle in an, in a never ending in a never ending torrent of hail fire which is a magic card i know shut up <laughs> the vaporization heating extreme extreme heating that's about as half half as hot uh two thirds as hot as the surface of the sun on that side magma ocean recapitulation in rock vaporization oh you can bet that Hayden Christensen would have been toasty AF. And actually, he would have died immediately. Uh, so I wanted to bring this up not only because it's a little clickbaity, but also um, it shows the range of planets and planetary life cycles that, we're prob that we don't always think about, right? So when we think of a planet... It's always like Earth. It's always finished. But um, this is a good glance, uh, as the researchers say, this is a good glimpse at a planet that's in a certain situation or uh, very early on in its life cycle. We don't get to see the evolution of planets just any old day. So confirming the existence of something like uh, a lava planet is important and cool. And now they need to verify everything with telescopes. Because, again, if you're just looking at the shadow of a planet, and not the planet itself. You have to do more science to figure it out. And that's what we're going to do. But don't go there. I'm warning you. You can't breathe rock. You can quote me on that. We have Dan Dunham. See, I got back from space. That's why I'm in the hangar. That's where I keep my spaceships. We have Dan Dunham with the 1499. He says, oh my goodness, your poor beard. Shut up. I look fine. I know. Also, salutations. I thoroughly enjoy your moving pictures. Okay, serious question. Have we gone past the point of no return with, with regards to climate change? We're not past the point of no return with climate change. Um, but we're getting close. And we need to... I mean, there's no actual timeline. No one really knows like when the tipping point is. is. Um, but we're certainly not doing enough. So I don't know. I don't know when the tipping point is. Nobody does. But we're not doing enough to address it right now. Uh, Bearded Bullets with the 10. It says, when we see things like asteroids or any object coming, any other object coming from outside our solar system, how can we tell the speed it is traveling versus how fast we are yeeting ourselves towards it? Um, computers and math. Uh, when you... you measuring velocity in space is difficult because it's always compared to what? Um right now us compared to the earth the earth is not moving uh but the earth compared to the sun or from the sun's frame of reference the earth is hurtling around it at 30 kilometers per second and from the galaxy's perspective the solar system is hurtling around it even faster and to another galaxy another galaxy is moving relative to that that galaxy so when we see other things in the sky um you measure it relative to another body you pick a reference frame you track it and then you put it in computers because it would be hard to do that by eye. Even it, it probably couldn't do that by eye, huh? We have Alicia with the 10 who says, the idea of a planet more terrifying than Venus is pretty impressive, as is the science used to discover it. Discover it. Side note, choose any facial hair you want, but if you cut your hair, there will be a riot. Do you know what I love? I love being constantly objectified. It's one of my favorite things. Do you know why I shaved? I will, a, it was getting gross. You only see me once a week or twice a week. I have to live with it. And it was getting gross. And I wasn't sure what was underneath my, my beard anymore. I wanted to check. And it wasn't like getting rough. And um, I shaved it on uh, the night the winner of the election was projected. I felt like I hadn't shaved in six months. And maybe this would be a good time just to start fresh. You know? 
and stop drinking so much. Jack NSA with the Ron 100. Don't know what that is, but I like it. So what would be... So would it be possible to extract minerals of a lava planet, and would it be easier to process them? Um, it's magma and rock vapor. So any, any machinery, any ships you're going to go down with the planet with, they have to endure, what, on the, on the day side, ambient 3,000 degree heat? I don't know of any material that cannot melt in that, literally. Not even tungsten or wolfram. Uh, so I don't think it'd be easier. It'd probably be much easier on something like an asteroid that's not geologically active. That isn't analogous to hell. Tom Bosch with the 20 says, Kyle, it's fair to say that you're spinning. Is it, is it fair to say that you're spinning from your perspective and still the universe is spinning around you? If it is fair to say that, isn't the universe spinning around you FTL? Yes, yeah, so this is an apparent violation of faster than speed of light or FTL. If you look at a star in the night sky, for example, and you track it as the Earth turns, um, you know how far that, that star is away, or you can look it up. And then if you calculate how fast that star appears to be moving through the night sky, then yes, it would be moving thousands of times the speed of light. But of course, this is an illusion. The Earth is spinning, and there's no actual movement like that of the star. So there are relative, and we go through this in an episode of Because Science, the faster than light guillotine, if you want to look it up. But uh, this is a relative light speed breaking illusion. There's no actual transfer of information or motion um, of the body FTL. Good question. Phil Morte with the 10 says, I'm a science imp. Love the channel and thank you for bringing your own and continuing, bringing your own and continuing the science talk for all of us. I can't not do it. It's like an addiction. I love learning. <laughs> you should see what I have cooked up. This week is going to be a good one, but uh, Thea and I are building something quite pointy. It's going to be cool. Hellhound with the 15 says, hey, Aria, love the Kyle. Qu She's not here, I think. What's your favorite planet? I like Titan. I know it's not a planet. I like it. Rodrigo de la Gala Bustamante with the 10 says, Hola, Kyle. Amo tu show. I understood that. Why? Because it's not Portuguese. Are you an Aerith boy or a Tifa boy? Uh, I'm going to come clean. I haven't played that game all the way through. I'm whatever the most cosplayed one is. Heather, one of my oldest professors, says, I tried to say, I tried to send, hey, Kyle, love the show in binary, but it wouldn't let me, so here's a simp for science anyway. Oh, I love it. Let's pause the Super Chats for just a second so we can get on to our next topic. And it's slightly depressing. Minx. Uh, one of the prized animals in the fur trade. Um, one of the animals that is, well, it's farmed, mink, minks are farmed heavily, heavily, millions of them for fur. And of course, many, many people over the years have called to the end, called for the end of the fur trade and to eliminate the conditions that minks have to um, sit in and endure. Separate issue. But because of the fur trade and the high demand, most of it from China, of mink fur, which is admittedly pretty so. I feel like I was backtracking. Anyway, because of the fur trade, um, you have situations in which millions and millions of animals are in pros close proximity to each other in substandard conditions. We know when that happens that that can be a breeding ground for viruses and their mutations. Saw it in swine flu, bird flu, and now multiple governments around the world and countries around the world have announced that they will be more or less wiping out all of their minks and eliminating their fur trade. A number of countries have said that uh, within the next few years, like 21, 2021, 2025, they will eliminate their fur trade with minks. Why? Well, because we just discovered a new coronavirus mutation in minks in Spain and uh, Dutch fur markets, etc. Why is that bad? Well, 
it's thought that these population of minks, let's be more accurate, these population of minks got COVID from people working at the mink farms. This means that humans with COVID were there and humans were in such close proximity to them for long enough that the virus could mutate and then have a reverse spillover effect, which we've talked about before on the show, and mutate enough so that it can jump into a new host, the mink. So why is that bad? Well, we, we would want to possibly, sorry, my nose is so itchy. <laughs> Don't give that. Governments are thinking that they want to eliminate all these mink populations by suffocation. It's a dirty, it's a dirty thing. Because if the mink population becomes a new reservoir of coronavirus across the world, and we've already seen some cross infection between other fur farms in the same states, I mean countries, if it becomes a new reservoir, then you have a different version of coronavirus with different mutations that could jump back into people. Because we know it already did the trip once. So if it jumps back into people and then spreads or it has a mutation that's even more lethal or it's even more infectious, then you have a strain of coronavirus that the vaccines being made right now or being studied right now won't work on or will be substantially less effective on. So obviously that would be a big problem with so many, I mean, 10 million cases in the United States as of today, uh, millions and millions of cases around the world. If we ship out a billion vaccines to try to deal with this, and this is a new strain that's spreading around, obviously our, our efforts are going to be culled, as it were. So they're eliminating most of the minks. Is it a perfect solution? No, but it's... It's an emergency situation that we're trying to deal with. And this isn't just a COVID-19 thing either. Viruses do this naturally. You can debate whether or not, whether or not a, a virus is truly alive, but viruses mutate naturally. It's just part of evolution and natural selection. The viruses that uh, have random mutations that tend to infect better or spread themselves better get selected for in the population. So we also deal with this problem with influenza, with the common flu, which is why each year vaccines have a different level of effectiveness and they're never like 99% effective. Um, they're like 60, 70% effective. And mind you, that doesn't sound great, but it still saves tens of thousands of people a year in the United States alone. So it's, it's definitely worth it. But that's the, that's the trick each year that epidemiologists are trying to, trying to take is predict what the virus is going to look like at a later time and make that vaccine. So we do not want to get into this arms race with COVID-19 where it keeps mutating in different populations and we have to keep making new and new vaccines every year, especially if it's going to be a more seasonal kind of thing. So if you heard about these adorable little fur snakes, that's what's happening to them. It's not a pretty situation. It's not a fun situation. If you're wondering why governments are culling them by the millions, that is why. Fighting pandemics is tough. Probably shouldn't have been here in the first place, but here we are. And now we can take the science seriously. Really get back on track in terms of leadership. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. And you know me, I'm not optimistic about nothing. Mar the Wanderer with the five says, everybody relax. Kyle's just temporarily retracting his beard to reabsorb some of its power. Did no one else notice he's taller when he's at the main desk? It's true. Every time I shave, it's, I'm just re resorbing protein and just getting bigger. <laughs> Lyrica says, wow, first live stream. Oh, look at you doing the thing. Look at us. We did it. Uh, Jay Pruler says they're vicious little rat killers. Eh, did, eh. Everything kills something. That's not true. Do plants kill anything? Well, that's true. Plants do kill stuff. Don't make, don't do that to me. 
Blitzkrieg says, it's horrible, I know, but biologists have been warning about these farms for decades. It's a long ways coming. Good point. A uh, similar point can be made with the so-called wet markets all across the world. When you have animals in these squalid, in this squalor, uh, it's just a breeding ground for this kind of thing. We should know better than that. And it's one of those older, you know, trades that's not modernized and stuff like, you know, uh, modern factory farming and stuff. Um, the day will come. The day will come. Sad Nut 95 says, oh, it must be November. Sad Nut says, uh, hey, oh, Kyle, hey, bro, I love your channel. Ah! Calm down, dude. <laughs> hey, thanks. Luigi Main says, look, it's funny science marker man. Well, I'm only one of those things anymore. Science man. I'm no longer funny. Uh, Fractured Raptor says, fur farms aren't the only things that need to die. Mills do too. Hey, fair enough. I don't know why I'm coming in so hot today. The Reich, the Reichenic, the Reichanic. Stop it. With the 10, says, hey, Kyle, figured I would say hello. One of my lovely facility staff members that you can join if you go to patreon.com slash Kyle. Have an engineering assignment due. Uh oh, just want to say happy Veterans Day to all my brothers and sisters. Keep doing what you are doing, my friend. Is it Veterans Day today? If it is, happy Veterans Day. Thank you for your service. I don't know. Is it? I don't know what time is anymore. I didn't even know what Portuguese was. I only know a few things. That's A, lava planets. B, bugs. C, why platypuses glow in the dark. Don't worry, we'll get to that. <laughs> Master of All is always coming in with the Australian $5. You know what I'm going to do. Morning, Kyle. Do you have any recommendations for bouldering pads looking in, uh, into getting into outdoor bouldering soon? Um, well, uh, crash pads, as they're called, uh, I don't really think you can go wrong. It depends on... Oh, <coughs> I'm no good. It depends on what you want to do and where you want to go. Um, smaller pads are fine if you have multiple people going and you know you're not going to be climbing anything that's that high or anything that's that overhanging and goes off into a different landing zone. Um, but if you're going to be going alone or you're going to be climbing some highball kind of stuff, then obviously you just want to get a bigger, bigger mat. But you can't really go wrong um, with with a crash pad. Just look for a good thickness because I have a sickness for thickness and look for a good thickness at a decent price. It's They're all more or less the same. Um, I would recommend though getting one. They probably all have this now, but I'd recommend getting one uh, with a backpack sewn onto it so you don't have to carry it um, like a weirdo. Uh, so with that, let's move on to our next topic, which is... Platties? Look at it. I do not like people calling platypi abominations. Look how adorable this monotreme is. Yeah, that's the word for it. It's weird and adorable. It's got a little duck bill. It's got... Look how fun its little eyes are. It senses the world through magneto and electro reception. It has fur so fine it repels water just because of its fineness of water and a bunch of stinky oil. It has a poisonous barb on its leg. For what? For no reason. Evolution was like, I don't know. Do it. It lays eggs. Weird. And they're adorable. They're just adorable. And I actually, now that, now that I'm saying all this out loud, I actually would push back against the abomination framing for a platypus because that, uh, that um, disguises or, no, it misrepresents how evolution works. Or like, you know, nature came up with a duck and a beaver and smashed them together. No, 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 no. Separate line perhaps some convergent evolution going on, but nature doesn't just slap two things together. It's not how nature works. And it's just, oh, he's so cute. Have you, and have you seen him do with their little beaks? Like, blah, 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 blah. it's adorable. Don't give that. Why am I talking about platypi? Well, in addition to all of the other cool weirdness associated with this animal, there's one more thing. Biofluorescence. Why? Uh, why? Why do they have this? <laughs> so biofluorescence is 
when an animal biofluoresces. There, end of show. No, just kidding. What am I, an abstract on PNAS? So biofluorescence is when an animal takes in light and whatever is on their body uh, gets excited by that light en uh, energy-wise. Excuse me. And then it re-emits that energy to de-excite de itself in another way. Um, fluorescence could, well, like, uh, think of those stars that you used to put on your ceiling as a kid. My mom did. She's great. Where you'd hold them under a light for a long time and then they'd be glow in the dark. That's fluorescence, where you're exciting something and then to return to a lower energy state, it's emitting light of its own. Um, there's a number of animals that do this. You can shine light, you can shine uh, UV light on uh, scorpions and such. And there's a number of mammals that have this. Um, you can, oh, and birds. There's a number of mammals. This is the only monotreme. We'll see in a second. But uh, birds, uh, owl feathers will fluoresce. But what about the platy? So on the left, you can see visible light, UV unfiltered, filtered reflectance. So, when, when the, these are uh, semi-aquatic, mainly, noctur mainly nocturnal animals, and when the sun reflects off of the moon onto their little squishy bodies, what comes off is UV light in this way, and they shine and fluoresce if you could possibly see it. Now, the study authors, you can see above, they don't know exactly why a platypus would be glowy glowy in this way. Um, quoting them, in the case of the platypus, a species that primarily navigates its world through mechanical reception and electroreception, not by sight, which is to say, you know, feeling stuff and feeling electric fields, not by sight, because they got tiny little eyes that aren't so great. We speculate, quoting again, that biofluorescence is less important for intraspecific interactions, so intraspecific would be within the species, saying like looking at each other, than it is for interspecies interactions, so between species, like interstellar, between stars. The absorbance of UV light, again quoting, and subsequent fluorescence of longer wavelengths may reduce the visibility of the platypus to UV-sensitive predators. Uh, like, uh, like a snake. For example, however, based on uh, however, field-based research will be essential to document platypus biofluorescence and its ecological function in wild animals. That is a fancy sentence to say. Uh, oh, <laughs> they don't know. I just want to point this out as a nice little counterpoint to that sad mink story. Platyp platypi also grow. How fun is that? Super. Sadness with the Canadian five dollars. The only abomination, the only abomination in the animal kingdom is pugs. I've, 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 I'm on record that pugs and pit bulls and other squashed can't be born naturally dogs should probably stop being bred. They live in constant pain and disease and agony. Leave them alone. If you really love your dog, leave it alone. I'm sure the ones that are alive right now are very good boys, I'm just saying. Don't make more of them. Living in pain. Heretic Hero says, e quote, even God has a sense of humor. Just look at the platypus. It's not funny. It's adorable. You know what's a stupid animal? Can't think of one. I love animals. Platinum, one of my oldest supporters, says, you trying to do a Canadian accent? I was for a second there, but then I only realized I can say, like, tomorrow and, like, post and things like that. So, yeah, I, I, that didn't, that didn't, it's worse than my Australian accent, and that's saying something. Alan Dishman with the five says, doobie doobie. Oh, God, you're going to make me sing. Doobie doobie doo, he's a semi-aquatic egg-laying mammal. Symphony for science, he's a gent, Kyle. How'd I do? Bulldogs and boxers, people are saying. Another random guy says, Kyle, listen to me. Uh -huh. If you put 
if you put all the atoms on Earth directly next to one of each directly next to one another in a line, how long would it be? Would it reach the edges of the galaxy? Oh, crap. No? I don't know. Um, so I'm not going to do the math in my head because I can't. Um, but what you would do is you need... Ugh, you would need to standardize all the material on Earth to make it easy. Make all, make all of Earth's mass one thing then you'd know how many moles of that thing you would have um, by volume and mass. And then you would multiply that number of moles by the number of atoms per mole, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. You should all know Avocado's number. And then if you multiply those two gigantic numbers together, you'd have the number of atoms, and then you need then you'd look up the average radius or diameter of those atoms and then you multiply that number by that average diameter or radius and then you get the length in probably light years or whatever it is but i can't do all of that in my head i just know it's going to be very far you know if uh i mean there's a, there's a trillion trillion kilograms in the earth and uh, you multiply uh, if uh, i can't do it in my head right now it's just going to be giant, giant numbers. You can do, I can do an order of magnitude estimation if you wanted to sit here and watch me go like this. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. Darren Carr with a 55555. Five, five, five. Hey Kyle, it's me. Beep, beep. Just got here. Thanks for the positivity last week and every week simping for the science and the arts. Yes. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> arts is also very important to ev everything that has to do with STEM. Without great art, science fiction, writing, Etc. Etc. Portraits, paintings, a lot of scientific uh, wonder wouldn't be had, and discoveries would not be made. Moxar is looking at the chat and shakes their head. Lucas Ditek says, "Oi show amo okayo. Saud, saudoses do Brasil. Salud." Uh, Indiana Tracy, cool name, says, Hey Kyle, when are you showing us your attempt at Ninja Warrior? I know it's on tape. It is. I didn't complete the course. And so I'm not going to release it because it makes me look not as cool. I'd like to try it again, though. Uh, Master of All with the Australian $5. Again, we were recently able to go back to my block chalk. My block chalk instead of liquid chalk at my climbing gym. Now, see, now it's, Brit now it's British. Do you know the main differences between the two? Um, liquid chalk, it's same basic components, you know, calcium carbonate and stuff, but uh, liquid chalk dries really fast. It's a good base layer. The pro professional climbers will put liquid chalk on first, let it dry, and then use uh, block chalk and uh, loose chalk and put that over the top. That's how they do it. Um, but I would be guessing that they don't want you using, well, I'm totally guessing. Uh, free chalk gets in the air like crazy and floats everywhere. I'm guessing they just want less part uh, particulate in the air. Full stop. Which I think, you know, I don't think it, it probably doesn't make a difference. Like epidemiology, but you know, it might. Epidemiologically. Sorcha Cantwell with the five says, I've not been able to catch a live stream for, for a while. Boo, but when I do, I found out that platypus glow. I know, it's fun, right? Learning is fun. Speaking of learning, let's go on to our whatever this is. Peer review. So, as I want to do on every episode of this show, I take one of your comments, questions, corrections, comments about my face from a previous episode of the facility, and uh, I highlight it, then I give you a plaque. Kevin gives you a plaque. He has the best plaques. We can laugh now. And then, if you're watching, you DM me, you get honorary membership to the facility for a month. Oh, that's a, that's a value of like $10 or less. Yeah, big spender. 
So the last episode of the facility was the gorgeous interaction of liquid nitrogen and gasoline. If you have not watched that episode, I highly recommend it. Put it on the biggest screen you got, the highest resolution it goes. Um, I've never seen anything prettier with my own eyes. It's so, like, sciency. It's so, so wondrous. But on that episode, Samus, uh, Seamus Strongheart says, This is stunning. I would like to recreate this experiment. How did you illuminate the contents of the dish? Keep smashing it, Walmart Thor. Love the content. First, shut up. Second, I realize, parents, that I'm saying shut up a lot, and I'm sorry. Kids shouldn't say that. It is annoying. But uh, to recreate that, the science itself did a lot of the work. But I wanted to illuminate the vapor such that it would give a more ethereal vapor wave enus to it. And uh, the lights I like are very small but very powerful. These are Litra or Lytra brand lights. Their casing is their own heat sink. Um, you can put gels on them. Or, sorry, I've been separating 3,000 magnets yesterday. Uh, they have gels which are removable. This is a blue gel. Uh, these can be controlled by your phone. Decent battery life. Um, they have hot shoe. Um, connections and stuff, and, you know, instantly turn them on, instant blueness. I have another one here, even smaller, you can put right on your camera, and more, more gels and such that you can do. So just a combination of gels. And now look, I'm America. <laughs> oh. So for pointing that out and making me give a product endorsement, you can tell them if you want. You, Seamus, are now an honorary member of the facility where you can now get Basilisk shirts. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. What? What do you mean they won't sponsor us? They, they'd only sponsored Bearded Me? Just a second. I'm sure your plaque's back there. I gotta, I gotta take a short commercial break and figure out this beardness. they say oh great so 2021 january first quarter first quarter we'll have the action figures fantastic well let me see what they look like <sighs> you gotta be kidding me with the beard right now kevin you know i was gonna save it on the election on the app yeah you're right i should stop yelling i'm sorry We have Crin Firelight who says, Flatfish are derpy. Yes, uh, Moa Moa, are they called? Jason Moa Moa? Mola Mola? Mola Mola Island? I forget. Sunfish. They're big, derpy, stupid looking bony th things. Uh, Matterbeam says, Original OG. That's redundant. OG MB says, Is your figurine drinking out of a roll of toilet paper? I didn't look at it that close. Is it? Maybe. All the kids are doing it. Uh, Corey Brown says, Dear Kyle, if you were a Warhammer 4K model, what faction would you be? I have no idea. I've never played. But if I was a StarCraft faction, I would be Zerg, probably. Because I like him. Boise Freerunners with the 10 says, I've actually trained quite a few people that have gone on American Ninja Warrior. A couple of them have done pretty, done pretty well. If you want some tips and tricks to up your ninja game, let me know. Well, I appreciate that. I've been watching a lot of CrossFit competitions. They seem like, on the whole, it's kind of a culty kind of thing, but you can't argue with their fitness. It's insane. I've tried even, like, little versions of some of those CrossFit workouts, and it destroys you. If you haven't done it before, it's, it's more or less physically impossible for you to do. Dr. Strange Jove, one of my greatest supporters, with a 20 says, Hey Kyle, are you going to be AOL? AWOL, sorry. I wasn't in the military. Are you going to go AWOL when Mass Effect Remaster releases? I wouldn't blame you if you do. Hashtag Renegade for life. A. No. Paragon. 
and B, um, you know, I've, I've flirted with the idea of doing some sort of uh, Twitch channel or a longer form stream here. And if we do Mass Effect, I think we do a Femship, Femship playthrough. And because Jennifer Hale is a friend of mine, what do you say I play through while we talk to her on Zoom and uh, do like an interview the whole time with like behind the scenes commentary the whole time? What do you think about that? <laughs> I already know what you think. Alan Dishman with the five. That was peer review instead of meme review. I've toyed with doing also like a science meme review kind of thing. David with the Canadian 10 says, is it possible to predict the future and or past if you had all the information in the universe at any given time or is there some unpredictable and random element? There's some randomness in the universe inherently in quantum mechanics and stuff, but um, I don't think it's a settled question whether or not quantum mechanics would really affect determinism in that way. So without having looked into the philosophical side of this in a very long time, I'm, I lean more towards hard determinism where, yes, if you had all the information in the universe down to the quantum level and a giant supercomputer like a Jupiter brain, you could predict what would happen at every moment of time past a future. What do I know? Look at me. Free me, 2705, with the 10, who says, Hey, Kyle, love the protein coming from your scalp. Thank you. Would blowing air gas out from a spacecraft and somehow recapturing it work for travel? Blowing gas out of a spacecraft is what spacecraft do now. So I'm assuming if there's a way to recapture exhaust, they would probably do that. Um, the problem being, just from a basic forces perspective, if you're spewing out gas this way at high velocity and you have like something like a capture mechanism this way, you have, when the... <sighs> when exhaust happens, the spacecraft goes this way, but when the exhaust hits the capture mechanism, it provides a pushing force this way, and now you don't move at all. So, seems like a fundamental physics problem there to, to recapture immediately. Um, Zypher with the 10 says, Hey Kyle, are wormholes mathematically or even theoretically possible? Or are they simply a hand wave aspect of sci-fi like warp speed or artificial gravity? You can get artificial gravity from spin gravity. It's not that hand wavy. Um, but wormholes, I'm going to flip your question a little bit. Wormholes are mathematically and, and uh, theoretically possible. The sci-fi depiction of them is what's probably not possible in my estimation where they're huge and they're, and they're held open for a long time. Right now, I think scientists are looking, or physicists rather, are looking into micro, like, uh, wormholes that only stay, you know, stay open for fractions of a fraction of fractions of a second, and they're, like, you know, nanoscale. So, um, yeah. So let's go on to our last topic before we run out of time here, which is depressing. It's not that depressing. This... Is a schematic of what these scientists are now calling an infodemic. And if you've been following me on Twitter, you know I've been talking about the infocalypse, the information apocalypse quite a bit. And they were talking about an infodemic, which I also like. So this is a study assessing the risks of infodemics in response to COVID-19. So what these researchers did was look at Twitter and 100 million tweets from March to July, uh, no, from, from like January to March. And they wanted to see how the information ecosystem would change in response to a pandemic and what mis and disinformation would do inside of that information ecosystem. Now, as you know, I hate social media. I think it's a mistake. You probably shouldn't be on it. It's hard, it's, it's rewiring your brain to be less cool <laughs> and more depressed and everything. But we're stuck with it, probably. So you know my thoughts on social media and you can suspect that this story doesn't have a happy ending in, in regards to social media. What the study found was that in, in, uh, in contrast to what you might think would happen, 
that an epidemic, a pandemic starts and people go to social media looking for experts, looking for good information. Oh, whoa, whoa, it's a disaster. What's going on? In fact, they do the opposite because social media, the, the, the machinery of social media is, is lubricated and fueled by emotion, by simple statements lacking nuance, by controversy, conflict. And it may not be monetized in that way, but it's monetized that way. It's valence is put upon you in that way with your own brain chemistry. So the, you know, the things that get likes and the notoriety you get, the popularity you get, that fuels this machine. Social outrage and, and, and contempt and conflict is, is what drives it, in, in addition to your data. And so what these researchers found was that at the start of the epidemic, people did not turn to reliable sources. Instead, they started glomming on to unreliable sources, sources of information that were high emotion, high conflict, very unreliable, and also because pieces of crap exist like this everywhere, bots and bad actors, sometimes governments that would and, and very, even in the United States government, people who would actively put out myths or disinformation in regard to the pandemic, like, oh, it's not, it's not so bad, or it's under control, when both of those things are totally not true. So we found that, again, social media, probably, I mean, if you really extrapolate it out, probably actively killing people. The researchers sound, also found something interesting and an interesting breakdown as well. So on the left here, you have a country uh, like Italy. And what you're seeing here is the lighter colors. So the, uh, the researchers looked at 10, 100 million tweets and they categorized all of them by reliable or not reliable information or bad information. And then they gave these countries a score as to how susceptible they were to mis- and disinformation, and the color relates to the risk. So the darker the color, the higher the population in, in that area was to mis- and disinformation, for whatever reason. And so you can see in some parts of Italy, it's different, and you can see in parts of the United States, it's different. But they also have a time, a timeline here. So this is the, the relative risk on the y-axis and on the x-axis is time. So you have January back here and you have March out there. And as you can see in the top, top here, this is showing how many cases are being reported of COVID. So as it goes from left to right, the COVID cases are going up and the pandemic is getting worse. What they found in most countries is that as you can see here from the informational risk, the risk goes down because as the cases start going up, as people actually start dying, as you know, more people have actual contact with this virus, people are like, they're more desperate and they're more turning to experts. They start to listen to the evidence better or more so. Most countries had that. Now look on the right to the United States. Constant, which is to say that the information risk, the risk that everyone in the country was to being susceptible or being uh, shown mis- and disinformation, stayed the same even as the pandemic got much, much worse. And it's, get, it's the worst it ever has been in America right now. Now, what can we tease out of that? If we look even further, we see that some states are more susceptible than other states. Now, again, this is not a political show, but if I were to notice something interesting, I would start to see some, somewhat of a distinction between traditionally red states and traditionally leaning blue states, where it, it appears that traditionally uh, blue or the bluest states are the least at risk, and more traditionally red states are more, relatively speaking, at risk. But on the whole, 
America's information risk stayed the same even as the pandemic was getting worse, which is bad, which means something in the American info ecosystem is tainted and polluted. And if you live in that country, you could probably see that. The other countries who have this same trend that America does, in res this infodemic trend, is like Iran. Something here about who's in charge, who's a so-called expert or not, the leadership on getting good information out into the American people, at least, seems like it has been much worse than other countries. And as we're more and more online, this is, be this is going to become more and more of a problem where your perception of reality can be different than someone in another country just because of what you see in social media. It is rewiring you and it can, it can literally lead to you taking, like risk-taking behaviors in a public health catastrophe. Like, meh, not wearing a mask because I saw someone on Twitter is like, why would I wear a mask? I'm Charlie Kirk and I'm dumb. <laughs> that was mean. Don't be mean, kids. But he's not the smartest man. Don't listen to Charlie Kirk. Five more minutes here. What are people saying? I don't know why I'm I don't know why I'm calling people out. You know, now that I have control of my own facility again, maybe I'm just getting I'm getting feisty. Some people saying no wonder Americans seem so dumb. Not all Americans are dumb. Not all of everyone is dumb, just on average, mathematically. But America also doesn't give you a lot of great counter evidence all the time. Freely admit that. Ori Gal taunting my security team in the chat. Eh, go ahead. Go ahead. Kick him out. I don't care. You mean nothing to me. <laughs> uh, a generic, uh, maybe read generic fool right there. I mean, my, my, my security team... Look, it, it could be political stuff is hard to moderate, especially when you're a science show. So if you feel like you're you were timed out or you're deleted, it, it don't it's not personal. And nothing's personal. I don't know you personally, and I never will. We have a CRC two and a half thousand. Don't know what it is, don't care. I like it. Luis Andres Zawan Ruiz. He says, Hey Kyle, love the show. What are some places on the internet that you recommend to actually get helpful information? Great question. Well, um, if you have a science background, reading the studies yourself is, you know, you can, you can always take a, uh, take a crack at that. Um, but, see, and see, this is the real nefarious part of the infocalypse, is that it makes you distrust facts and experts more. So what I'm about to say might not hit all Americans the same way, but places, institutions who hire people who have, in, have dedicated their entire life to solving difficult scientific and health-related questions. The, the chances that those people are part of a grand conspiracy is effectively zero. Places like the CDC, where it has literally the smartest people on the planet working there, the best doctors, the best nurses, the best epidemiologists, the best virologists, everyone, when it hasn't, when it's not infiltrated by political stuff, those really are the authoritative voices. Um, other institutions, uh, research institutions, you know, like uh, research hospitals and uh, universities, those kind of places. I know it sounds elitist, but it only sounds elitist because that Americans made that a bad thing. I want elitism in my science. I want to go. Well, I mean, you've been. You've been studying how droplets move through the air for 25 years. What do I know? <laughs> you know, it's the, re it's the real state of things. People are experts for a reason. Sometimes you have experts that get on TV who are obviously not qualified to talk about what they want to talk about. But for the most part, you're all nerds. Scientists and doctors and nurses, they're nerds too. They've, they've dedicated their entire life 
to studying just a few things to make the world what they would see as a better place and to help people. Listen to doctors, you know? Don't yell at doctors in the street. How dare you? Someone raised you wrong. Unless it's like Dr. Phil. You can yell at him. You have my permission. Or Dr. Oz. You can also yell at him. Because they're bad information. They're part of the infocalypse. They really are. They, they, they make, they, they, it's a, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a Russian disinformation tactic. Don't ask me how I know that. Um, where you want to increase the noise to signal ratio. You don't have to say, you don't have to, you don't have to tell lies. You just have to put so much information out there that people will get so bored that, that people will think it's impossible to tell the truth anymore, to figure out the truth. They put so much information in the ecosystem that we, on a day-to-day -day basis, can't be bothered to look into details anymore. It's a very, it's a very uh, nefarious way of going about it. And they do it right now. And, they're do and North Korea is doing it and China is doing it. People like Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil do it by putting a lot of weird health information out there, saying homeopathy is cool. It's not. Bauti Para with the ARS 1000. How much is that? Don't care because love the show. Thanks for the content. Thank you. Thank you for simping. Uh, everyone over the last uh, couple of days and weeks has been uh, incredible. And uh, I should say that going into December, uh, I don't know if you want to check my Twitter, we will be doing... Uh, if you like science on YouTube, you're going to want to watch on December 1st, me and Game Theory. Well, Game Theory is putting it on. I'm just going to show up for a little bit. But Game Theory is doing a $1 million challenge raising money for St. Jude. I think they're trying to raise $1 million in like 10 hours or whatever. December 1st, it's going to be it's going to be me. It's going to be Mr. Beast. It's going to be a Good Mythical Morning. It's going to be Veritasium. Uh, physics girl, uh, Sophia, uh, disguised toast. Uh, so many, so many giant, uh, names and personalities and a ton of people from science YouTube. So, uh, December 1st, look for that live stream. It will be on the front page of YouTube if you're looking for it. And after December 1st, we'll be using all of our simping for science to go to a specific charity that we'll be talking about uh, in December. So December, we'll be raising money for a good cause, uh, all December, uh, because that's the spirit of the holiday because we're, we, you shouldn't be going anywhere and meeting with people. So we're going to feel good about raising money for those, uh, in need. And finally, as always coming in hot, the end of the stream, music central piano 29 with the 50 it says, keep up the great work, Kyle, great topics agreed. Again, we need to let the it's experts handle this situation. Sam Harris put it best, said not all not all opinions need to matter. That's what it means to be an expert and to have expertise. I couldn't agree more. You know, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. As the hitch would say. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode. What did we what did we talk about? We talked about lava planets and how this is literally hell. I mean, it's more likely than, you know, something to be, like, under your feet and have, like, a big furry demon, right? Oh, I'm going to burn your feet. That was one of the circles of hell. Look it up. Read a book. Talked about why a lot of minks aren't going to make it. It's because they might have a new COVID mutation that could spread back into people, make it much harder to treat. This pandemic, we also talked about, hey, did you know that platypuses glow in the dark? Well, they don't glow in the dark. They biofluoresce. Ultraviolet light. We also took one of your comments from the facility. I use high strength LED, Leecher or Lytra lights. That's how I make things look pretty. And finally, we talked about the infocalypse, the infodemic. Be very wary of what you see on social media, especially during contentious times like elections or pandemics. Stay smart. Stay strong. F facts. Son muy fuerte. I think I know what I said there. If you want to continue on this conversation, of course, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and get your silky white lab coat. Join the facility staff. 
and you get episodes early. You get to talk with me every day on Discord or thereabouts. I've been kind of busy, like, moving 3,000 magnets around, and there's currently a head in my fridge. I'm not kidding. So, I, you know, I, I try to... Uh, I, I lurk. You can also get behind-the-scenes content. All this wonderful stuff that you may or may not want to pay for. Thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. The episode this week has to do with a pet that millions of you probably have. Literally. And they're little murder machines. And I recently got one, and it's so cute, but also... S it hurts me so much that I made a video about it. So, look forward to that. And until next time, be nice to each other, especially on social media. Because it doesn't represent the view of the majority of people. And this is all we got. Bye!